Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's online conference. As we get things started, folks, we'd like to open our program by saying a very big thank you to our sponsor, Green Plum, today, and let you all know that EMC Green Plum is driving the future of data warehousing and analytics with breakthrough products, including the Green Plum Data Computing Appliance, Green Plum Database, Greenplum HD Enterprise Ready Apache Hadoop, and Greenplum Chorus, the industry's first enterprise data cloud platform. EMC Corporation is the world's leading developer and provider of information, infrastructure, technology, and solutions. Thank you again, Greenplum. All righty, folks. To get things started, I'd like to go over just a little bit of housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's online conference. You'd like to have your group chat open. That's that little widget at the bottom of your console that says group chat. If you could open that, that's what we will use to communicate and interact with today. That is also where you can post your questions for Q&A for our speakers. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you would like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account it will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And folks, today our hashtag is StratAConf, all one word. If you should have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have trouble, just post it in the group chat and one of our team will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, try refreshing your window and remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's online conference, and we'll have the archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to your chair, Alistair Kroll, for his opening comments. Hello, Alistair. Hi. Hi, Asmina. <clears throat> Thank you for the intro. Um, and hello, everybody. We're um, going to spend a little time today talking about uh, what we're going to look at at Strata, uh, which happens in about a week and a half on the West Coast. Um, and we've kind of cherry-picked some of the most fascinating and, and controversial and provocative topics to give you a good cross-section of some of the stuff that's going to be happening uh, next week. Some people aren't going to be able to make it. We hope all of you can, but if you can't, this will give you a taste of some of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to kick things off by explaining a little bit about something uh, we call the business singularity. Uh, on the first day of Strata, that's the Tuesday, uh, we actually have something we run called uh, the Data Driven Business Day. And this is where we take uh, traditional business problems and we try and uh, apply uh, data and new interfaces and ubiquitous computing to solve those problems. So how do things like uh, HR or finance or uh, operational theory or strategic planning change uh, under the harsh light of data? And how does that really um, alter how business people make decisions? I think that business is undergoing a significant change um, because of this particular uh, shift. So if you think about an exponential curve, exponential curves gradually inexorably grow until they reach some kind of a limit. The function of an exponential curve uh, generally moves towards um, uh, a line called an asymptote or a point where you can't move beyond it easily, um, sometimes referred to as a singularity. That's why a force like gravity, which grows exponentially as objects with mass get closer to one another, um, eventually leads to a black hole. In the middle of this black hole is a point of infinite mass, or theoretically infinite mass, a singularity within which the rules no longer apply. The physics singularity isn't the only uh, singularity out there, um, because it's not the only thing driven by exponents. Uh, financiers like exponents too. Compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe, said someone. Uh, many people attribute that to Einstein. But whoever said it was right. If you pump the proceeds of interest back into a bank account, it will inexorably, inevitably grow steadily. Computer scientists like to throw the term singularity around as well. To them, it's the moment when the machines become intelligent enough to make a better machine. It's the geek rapture, the capital S singularity. It's the day when the machines don't need us anymore, and to them, we look like little more than ants. Now, nobody knows this better than a uh, futurist and uh, programmer and uh, all-around brilliant guy, Ray, Ray Kurzweil, who says that this geek rapture is right around the corner, circa 2045, 
And that after that time, to us, these artificial intelligences simply become incomprehensible. Businesses, I believe, need to understand singularities because they have one of their own with which to contend due to the rise of big data. For centuries, since at the start of the industrial era at least, business has been about scale. As a business student, I was constantly told that bigger companies always have the upper hand. Economies of scale are the only long-term sustainable advantage, said my teachers, because with that scale you can control markets, set prices, own channels, influence regulators, and so on. And whether you like them or not, um, and however you feel about them, the embodiment of this obsession with scale is the corporation. You may have issues with today's companies that are, too, that are people too mindset, but remember that companies were initially conceived to allow huge projects like transcontinental railroads to happen while shielding investors from the equally huge and unthinkable risks. I mean, before a corporation, it took a monarch to build something truly epic. Now, a corporation, as you know it today, um, wouldn't be possible without an organization that could itself scale. Uh, this gentleman, Daniel McCallum, first realized that organizational charts and spans of control allowed the railroads to scale beyond 50-mile long stretches of track, and since that time, we really haven't looked back. Just as standardization led to the mass production of everything from cars to armaments, so the organization chart made global companies possible at scale. Scale is, in fact, so entrenched in our society that it's built into our fundamental economic indicators. Gross domestic product, or GDP, rewards national productivity rather than, for example, individual productivity or citizen happiness. So that means if you can't make your GDP grow by becoming more productive or improving things, you can always grow your population. But I believe that thanks to software and big data, the importance of scale is waning. Super investor and all-around smart guy Mark Andreessen once observed that software is eating the world. Once a process becomes digital at one end and digital at the other, it quickly turns digital in the middle. As the inputs and outputs of an industry become increasingly digital, the middle, that organization, inevitably becomes software. So why, why is software different? Well, I think it has two fundamental attributes that change how businesses are run. The first is that software has no choice but to record what it's doing. Digital systems leave a digital exhaust trail, an analytical breadcrumb, that, can ha that happens just automatically. An employee doesn't record how long it takes him or her to do something, but software has no choice but to do so. Put another way, uh, HR is rough and toothless. Software optimization is tough and ruthless because software can be optimized. Managing humans might be messy. It's fraught with emotion. It's governed by employment law, but nobody cares about pitting two algorithms against one another. There's nobody out there unionizing algorithms. And so those two algorithms fight in a battle to the death. Humans retire, but code gets a faster processor. And yes, that's a pretty controversial and somewhat troubling thing, but it is the way many people think about software. Analysis and optimization lead to a continuous loop of continuous improvement. They give us this exponential function for business. And as Hollywood, if it's taught us anything, um, it suggests that singularities aren't really good for those that are left behind. Closer to home, um, we've seen the impact of runaway algorithms. For example, uh, algorithmic trading crashing a, a bank market, uh, or uh, in another example, um, the excesses of warrantless wiretapping. Clearly, as humans, we haven't figured out how to harness our connected world for the greater good yet, especially when we hook it up to machines. But remember, the Terminator was a cyborg literally a cybernetic organism. Cybernetics is the study of feedback loops. According to Wikipedia, a system being analyzed is involved in a closed signaling loop, which means that an action that the system generates generates some change in its environment, and that change is reflected in the system in some feedback manner. It leads to this circularly causal relationship. And this is key to cybernetics, but it's also key to how businesses are run in a modern data-driven era. The business singularity then is about creating a business that analyzes changes in its environment and turns them into system updates. And the smartest companies know this. They instrument every facet of their business, and then they figure out how to tweak it. I joked the other day with some friends that Google's business plan is really to get to the singularity first, because after that it won't matter. Maybe that's more right than it seems. Maybe organizations that get to the business singularity first simply won't care about their competitors. Companies that learn to harness the power of data iteratively stop worrying about scale and start worrying about cycle time. To them, everything is an experiment, a chance to optimize. They analyze everything and they feed this back into themselves, continuously engineering their improved successor. 
Scale might happen. In fact, it probably does because software is easy to replicate. But it's a natural consequence of circular causal loops. It's this cycle of learning and optimization accelerated by software and the data exhaust of a connected society that really pushes businesses towards a limit, a point at which they stop behaving like organizations and start behaving like organisms. Importantly, companies on that side of the business singularity will seem opaque to us. They'll seem like they're shifting and transient and unthinkably agile. And to, tra to them, traditional businesses will seem sluggish and predictable and wise, like ants. Now, this seems pretty hyperbolic and fanciful, and smarter folks than I have called it mere hyperbole, and so I want to talk a little bit about a concrete example. Let me give you an example from the world of virality. To an analytics wonk, the number of people who adopt a product because an existing user told them they should do so is measured with something called the viral coefficient. If every user of your application or product tells at least one other user and convinces them to join, you have a business that grows by itself. Hotmail rode this virality to a $300 million exit because every mail it sent contained a little vector for infection. But there's a second viral metric, much less talked about, sometimes much more important, called viral cycle time. This is the delay between when someone signs up for a service and when they actually invite others. In the early days of YouTube, there were several video sites competing in the rapidly growing, growing online video sector. YouTube wasn't the best. It didn't have the best viral coefficient. Companies like Tableau um, did better. But what YouTube did have was really, really good cycle time. People tended to share a video with others more quickly on YouTube than on competing sites. As a result, YouTube quickly left others in the dust. And frankly, um, when you can't find a company's logo on the Internet, that's the sign that you lost a particular market. Companies like Google and Amazon care as much about the cycle time at which they learn as they do about their ability to generate products and services. I mean, sure, they have big scale, but you've got to realize scale here is a side effect of rapid iteration and growth with software. Everything these companies do is an experiment. Scale is okay because it gives them more test subjects and increases the confidence level of the results. But scale isn't the point. Quick learning is. The goal is to learn. These companies get better and more efficient, and the next cycle is infinitesimally tighter and they bend slowly towards that singularity. There's another definition of singularity, a peculiarity or an odd trait. Today, companies that are passing through to the other side of the business singularity look kind of weird to us. I mean, they do really strange things. They invest in solar cells, even though it's not their core business. Um, they wear things like strange goggles on public transport. Uh, they offer infrastructure to their competitors, or they open source it. They behave really strangely, at least to us, trading things like profit for things like iteration. They get uncomfortably close to their customers and their critics. Now, I don't think accountants have a metric for how fast the organism learns, but they'd better get one soon. For modern businesses built with little CapEx thanks to the clouds, marketed with little investment thanks to social media, learning is a company's greatest asset. Learning faster is enough to unseat the titans of industry. Those on the other side of the business singularity live by cycle time, and those on this side seldom think about it. I've definitely abused the notion of singularity in this presentation, and maybe this isn't as tectonic a shift as the rise of sentient machines or the middle of a black hole, but it's certainly more than just the evolution of businesses, because it's the migration from a physical world to a digital one. We're moving from a business ecosystem where those who have scale win to, those where, to one where those who have better cycles of adaptation and learning win. So that at a very high level is the kind of stuff that I'm going to be talking about during the Data-Driven Business Day with a number of uh, case studies and presenters talking about those things. Um, I want to give you a quick look at today's lineup. Um, today's lineup includes a number of interesting presentations, although we're not actually going to do this order, uh, but we're going to be talking about everything from zombies and vampires to artificial intelligence to visualization to uh, IT using big data to data journalism uh, to SQL and uh, the future of big data. Uh, we have an interesting lineup ahead of us, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and now I'm going to hand things over to our first presenter, uh, Elizabeth Crawford from Birchbox. Elizabeth. Hi. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the sort of the intersection of operations research and AI, which is something near and dear to our hearts at Birchbox. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Birchbox, we're a discovery platform for beauty, grooming, and lifestyle products. And basically, our aim is to help people discover new products and brands, these, so products and brands that are right for them, and we do that via our online store and through subscription services where we send people personalized boxes of products that they can try out and learn about through our original editorial content. 
So next slide sort of shows you an example of some of these boxes from the women's subscription. There's also a men's subscription. So one of the key challenges that we have is something that we call the birch box problem. And what it basically is, is this every month we have all these different products and samples. So we have a huge number of these and we need to work out which samples to send which customer. And so we send out a limited number of boxes every month. So if you consider the women's subscription, maybe in one month we might send out 30 different box types. We have to design what products go in each one of those boxes and then we have to work out which box goes to which customer. And we have a lot of different data that we can use to work this out. And if you think about the products that we have, we have a limited supply of them. So we don't have an endless number of each different product or each different sample. Um, there's some limited amount of them. And so this becomes basically an optimization problem. So we also have profile data about our customers. So we know things like um, their ethnographic profile, we know about their skin type, their hair color, these types of things. And we know how that relates to the different products in some way. So we might know the color of a color sample or what type of hair a particular hair product is suitable for. So there's a lot of domain knowledge here that is important, a lot of encoding that is required. And then we can see sort of how those two things match up. Um, there's also a lot of other constraints you might consider in a problem like this. For example, you may not want to send a person the same product twice. That definitely is not going to help anyone discover new things. But essentially at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is work out how can we send people boxes of products that are going to make them the happiest, that are going to make them um, refer their friends, going to make them happy, um, that will make them stay customers the longest, and that will make them go and buy the full-size versions at some point on our website. So it's got to do with maximizing their customer lifetime value. So if you're familiar with um, operations research, you've probably gone, aha, uh -huh, this is an operations research problem. Um, and essentially, operations research is about finding the optimal way to do things. Um, and there's like, different techniques from operations research that are used to address many different types of problems in the real world. Um, for example, you might be familiar with like a broad class of problems known as facility location. That's something that comes up a lot, like problems like where should I put my warehouses, where should I put my distribution centers, um, you know, if you're a zip car, where should you put all those zip cars and how many of them should you have. Um, so operations research, it's a very common kind of, it addresses a lot of very practical problems and how do you solve them. And the Birchbox problem is essentially an operations research problem at the end of the day. So when you're looking at something like this, before you can get started on having a computer to solve it, obviously you try and write it up mathematically. And so that's what this next slide has. It's got an example of one way to formulate this. So it's a little complicated, but we can talk through it a bit. Um, so if you look at that optimization function, that objective function there, what we're basically trying to do is maximize happiness, and that is the, um, the function H. And so if we have N subscribers to whom we need to send a birch box, we have M products that we can put into their birch boxes with quantity QI of product I, what we're trying to then do is maximize that happiness function. So there's a few elements here. So if you look at the term B, that is the binary assignment matrix, and that gets assigned to one if product I is assigned to user J. And you can see that there's a bunch of restrictions on it. So we've encoded these restrictions such that in that second term there, we don't use more inventory than we have for any one product. So that's that sort of second row. And then lower down, it, we've made sure that every subscriber gets N products. So N might be different in different months, but um, for our business it's usually four or five or six. Um, and then this is basically the way you're sort of ensuring that the, some of the hard constraints get solved. So this happiness function, that is where we go and put things like statistical inference. So the happiness function is basically your prediction of user J's satisfaction with product I. So we'll talk a little bit about how you can come up with stuff like that. Um, but that's where some of your statistical inference will go. And then we have this other very general term in there, 
F of B. And what that's doing is that's allowing us to assess the quality of the assignment at a higher level. So we can do all sorts of things with that term. So for example, we could bound the number of box types. We could say that each box needs to have a certain type of sample. It's giving us a lot of flexibility in sort of having higher level types of constraints that look at the entire um, assignment matrix and not just a satisfaction with a particular product. Okay. So that's basically one way of representing a problem like this. And there's a lot that goes into it and it's quite complicated. It's a sort of problem that you can spend a lot of time working on and optimizing different parts of it. The, but when you start with a problem like this, it's quite productive to break it down into smaller parts. So one of the ways we got started on something like this was to start by fixing the box types. So the way we fix the box types is through a mixture of science and human expertise. And then what we do is we take the allocation problem itself, so once we have the fixed box types, um, we take the allocation problem, we encode it as a mixed integer program, and then we use a solver to get the solution. And so this is the sort of thing you can do in many different domains. If you can encode part of your problem as something like a mixed integer program or as an LP, then you have the ability to use some very advanced software to solve your massive problem for you. So in our case, this ends up by being a matrix with a trillion entries, and that's not the sort of thing that you want to write your own code to solve if you can avoid it. So we use something called Garobi, it's like some great commercial software, and it can handle that size problem for us very effectively. Um, so this is a nice thing to be able to do. But to talk a little bit more about the, the statistical inference side of things. So if you look at that happiness function H, that is where you can use all your different types of domain knowledge and machine learning. So you're able to do your predictive analysis about what a user might like to receive. So you can look at things like, for example, at Birchbox we have review data, so we know what customers have rated different products in the past. Um, we also have their purchase data. Um, we can look at log data from what they've looked at on the website. So you can incorporate that sort of data into predictive models of what they are going to like to receive. And you can then encode that inside your optimization problem. So this is the sort of way you can take, you know, techniques from artificial intelligence, domain modeling, and machine learning, and then you can combine them with techniques from operations research to solve optimization problems and make decisions. So Alistair, I think you're going to ask some questions. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting overview. It sounds like you're really trying hard to um, uh, achieve sort of a, a level of nirvana that requires a lot of quantification. I mean, you're, you've got an equation. It's the first time I've ever seen an equation for happiness. It makes me feel enlightened. <laughs> um, but the inputs to that equation for happiness are based on a set of factors that you've uh, determined are best. So how do you choose, let's get philosophical for a second, how do you choose the inputs to happiness? Yeah, I think it's a very good, good question. So whenever you're dealing with optimization problems, you end up by getting into utility theory at some point, right? So it's, um, that's always a bit of an issue. And you can basically come up with heuristics for what people will, will like. So you can make a guess. You can say that I am going to score this particular product for this person. I'm going to give that a score of five because I think that people who are over 35, they love um, anti-wrinkle cream, and this product's an anti-wrinkle cream. Right. So you can go and make guesses about things like that, and we do make some guesses about things like that, um, but you can also try and look at your past experience. Um, but that's not a simple thing to do, because you're taking data from multiple sources. So often with things like this, you don't get a really good piece of feedback data. So no one's going to tell you exactly how much they like the sample necessarily, but sometimes you get that information. Well, I mean, this was my, the question I was thinking was, basically you've created Elizabeth's happiness algorithm because Elizabeth thinks that this is what someone would like by proxy, right? So, you know, maybe the person was incredibly insulted to be sent wrinkle cream and they're saying, what do you think, I am old? Um, and I'm not saying that happens, but there is, 
there's always this observer bias when trying to pick the inputs into a function like that. Um, and where... so do you guys have any way to control for that? I mean, do you have like, presumably when people buy a follow-up book, they get some kind of, let's say I buy skin cream and it makes all my wrinkles go in and feel young, mm -hmm. and I rush out to buy a crate of it. Is there a coupon that you include that you then track to close the feedback loop and, and find out outcomes? Yeah, so we have multiple sources of data. So some of the data you get is explicit because we have feedback data. So when customers get their box, they are given points for rating the products in their box. So that's a very explicit piece of data. You're rating on the sample that you received or you're rating on the product that you received. So a score, you know, a star, a star rating. So it's a very explicit piece of feedback on how much they liked receiving that sample. And what percentage of people actually give you a rating? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure because it varies month to month, but it's a very solid percentage. And it's, it's incented? Do you get like coupons for doing more or something? You get points, which okay, you can then spend in the online store. Ah, really? Um, okay, so you do have a clue system. That's cool. Yeah. And so then the other um, thing that you have is you have purchase data. So you know if they went out and bought the product. Um, and then you can also look at did they remain a subscriber after they received the box is another example. And then you can also look at did they refer people after they received the box. So there's all these indirect pieces of information you also get that can indicate how much somebody liked what they received. Got it. Okay, uh, yeah. one more quick question, and then question. I'm definitely going to want to watch the rest of these in, um, in Santa Clara, but this is fascinating. Uh, did the company start with optimization in mind, or did it just start as a way of setting up product, and then, you know, which came first, in this case, the algorithm or the shipping of boxes? The shipping of boxes came first, but it was always with the aim of having it be personalized. So always with the notion that there was a profile um, and that the idea was to send people the products that were right for them. Cool. Interesting. Um, um, I noticed one person in the chat is asking questions about the math, so hopefully we're touching on some of those as we go. <laughs> um, so Elizabeth, this is a, a very interesting look at it. I, I kind of want to go out and look at my face in the mirror now and make sure it's not too wrinkly. But uh, thank you very much for spending a lot of time with us today to understand this. Really looking forward to hearing the full presentation at uh, Strata in a week or so. Great. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, now we're going to hand things over to Tim uh, O'Brien. Um, despite the fact that O'Brien and O'Reilly sound very similar, uh, Tim is actually an independent consultant uh, focused on enterprise architecture and scalability. Uh, a few years ago when we started talking about NoSQL, um, I remember having a conversation with someone where I argued that it should actually be called no join, and I think uh, the irony today is that the default language by which people access uh, real-time big data is often a SQL interface. So um, if the future of NoSQL was NoSQL, um, Tim's here to tell us about the future of big data as a whole. Hand things over to Tim now. Hello. Um, I, I, and I just like to say I found the previous presentation very interesting because uh, consumer recommendations is a, is, a, is a huge thing, and I think you know, right now, Netflix is recommending that my seven-year-old continue watching House of Cards, which is a huge problem for me. So I would like to see some more innovative solutions for that as we go forward. So right here, it says I work for O'Reilly Media. That's, that, that used to be true. Uh, I still do some work for O'Reilly, but I, I uh, work for myself, a company called Discursive. And what I do is I help companies relate to developers. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the future of relational. So I'm going to give a presentation that's a little bit of a contrarian view of big data. Um, but don't mistake that for me attacking big data. I think that Hadoop and all of these technologies are essential, and there are problems that you need these technologies for to solve. But what I really want to talk about is this idea that SQL is a boogeyman. And that's something that I've encountered, at least myself, on the projects that, 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 that I work on. Um, Pretty big projects, so I do a lot of projects for companies I can't necessarily name, but uh, say a large, a large educational company um, creates a system that has to be used by, let's say, 400,000 users, um, and this is the sort of scale at which you're not at a Facebook scale, you're not at a Google scale. You can realistically do that with a traditional relational database if you throw enough hardware on it. But right now, I've found more and more what we're seeing is. SQL is viewed as a bad architectural decision up front. And people are pushing for NoSQL solutions. And I think that NoSQL is great when it's appropriate. And what I want to do is not assume that everyone has the context that I have. I want to talk about what the world used to be like to people who are now as old as I am, dinosaurs. Let's talk about 2000. 
So in the year 2000 and the year 1998, remember, this was back when the web was not new, but new for most people. Right? I was working at uh, the street.com, I was working at Forbes.com. A really heavy day would be maybe 600, maybe 700 simultaneous users. Right? And uh, scaling to that level was a feat, and it was amazing. Right? Back then, if we look at the software landscape, we saw that open source Java was still very new. There was a thing called Jakarta. Proprietary application servers were the name of the game. So we're talking about AGG Dynamo. We're talking about WebLogic. Um, if you were running, a, it, if you were trying to run a Forbes, you would probably give a company like AGG a couple hundred thousand dollars. Hardware was also very, very different. Linux was possible, but not probable. While companies like Google started early on using using um, low-cost components for hardware, this wasn't the norm until about 2004, 2005. So back at Forbes, I remember very clearly that we were running uh, EU450s and EU4500, very expensive machines. So one thing that I remember happening to me, especially at Forbes, is you'd be playing a game of foosball back then during the first bubble because we all had time to play foosball, right? And you'd say, what are those purple boxes over there? And someone would say, oh, that's $3 million worth of Sun servers. Uh, do you want to see the server room? So two things was it was normal for companies to spend a lot of money on hardware, and it was also normal for companies to be able to access their server rooms. Those two things are not necessarily true today. So I want to attack this, this idea from the concept of architecture. During the early web, this was the architectural approach you would see most often, sort of a end-to-end approach. You'd have presentation logic, application logic, and maybe some sort of persistence logic. And this is an approach that we still see today. If you were having problems with scale, what you would do is you would just throw more applications at your database. If that didn't work, you would throw maybe another database at the problem, or you'd start using clusters. But one thing was clear. By the end of this period, horizontal scale was possible in every layer except the database. So at the end of 2005 or the beginning of 2006, although companies were doing these things before, there was something of a singularity. So let's very quickly talk about what was the reality at the end of 2005 at a company that was, was sort of pursuing this, this, this standard goal of scalability. The norm in 2005 is that OO model object-oriented models were being mapped to tables. Right? SQL ruled these architectures. It still does. And, and it was the age of seriously enterprisey architects. So back then, I remember it was all the rage to get a license to Rational Road. Right? It was all the rage to model your system in UML. These are trends that have expired, thankfully. Um, big upfront design was also something that we were very much used to. You would hear people say, oh, well, we need to get an enterprise architect in here to do, uh, to do a, a, a quick architecture. Well, times changed, right? In 2006, the whole landscape changed. I think open source Java, in particular, killed the app server. Right? No longer could you count on a company dropping a half a million dollars on a vendor's you know, app server. I mean, at the time, even, it just wasn't, it didn't make sense. Open source databases were starting to challenge vendors. Oracle was the accepted norm at the beginning of the decade. MySQL was making dramatic inroads. Um, also, Linux. Linux really didn't arrive until the middle part of last decade. Commodity hardware was cheaper. There was more of it. Never again were you going to see someone buy an E4500. Now, maybe at some corporations that still follow these sort of older practices, uh, pre-singularity co 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 corporations. But if you were trying to build a website that scaled, it was cheap hardware, horizontal scale. And also, cloud computing, VMs, all of these things were starting to, to really hit the mainstream. There was also a culture shift, and I think this is the most important thing. Open source by default was something that more and more people were finding to be acceptable. So around that same time, this is the singularity, right? This is the beginning of the revolution that made the conference like Strata possible. 
Google's Big Table paper was published. Now, they had been doing this for some time before the paper was published, but this is when it became clear to people what, what the future looked like. Yahoo followed quickly thereafter. Doug, uh, Doug Cutting uh, was working for Yahoo at the time. Uh, he was the mastermind behind Lucene. Um, he started a, a project called Nutch. Nutch turned into Hadoop, and Hadoop has blossomed into just an entire economy. So at this point, 2006 to 2007, if you're working at a large website, you see what the future is, and the future is not a relational database. 2007 saw the rise of something of a cultural reaction, right, Rails. I give Rails a lot of credit. Some people think I give it too much credit, but I think Rails changed the way that applications are developed. It was something of a shot at the bow of Java, right? David. Heinemeyer Hansen kind of started a revolution of sorts. And one of his revolutions was don't use foreign keys, right? If you really need transactions, think simpler about your database. And I think that he didn't kill the database by any means. Basecamp still uses a MySQL database, a single one at that. But what he did is he sort of chipped away at this orthodoxy of enterprise development. And if you look at, you know, many startups today, still use Rails. It's still viewed as the fastest avenue to getting something done. Then you see, after that singularity that Google sort of ushered in, you see this revolution, but big data and NoSQL. I think these are two concepts that we conflate. Um, I think wrongly. I think they're two separate things entirely. But big data, right, these are essential ideas if you are Google, if you're Facebook, if you're some of the clients of a uh, Palantir or a Tableau, you need big data. The IRS needs big data. The NSA needs big data. Um, log analysis, search, intelligence, ad networks. These problems will never, ever be solved properly with an RDBMS. NoSQL is a whole different matter entirely. And if you look at NoSQL, it sort of collided with traditional application development. And you see a lot of application developers are now thinking, well, let's skip the relational database entirely. Let's just start using MongoDB. Let's start using Couch. And that's something that I see for a certain segment of the population. But more and more, what I'm seeing is that there's something of a backlash to this idea that the relational database is dead. I think for a handful of companies, a lot of well-funded startups, I think relational databases are dead, yes. But I think the majority of, of uh, companies still have a massive investment in SQL. I'm not going to put a number on that. I actually believe that most of those numbers are inaccurate estimates of death. And I see that big data is incredibly important, but the tip of the market is driving the tastes and trends for the majority of developers. I think most businesses still use SQL for a majority of applications. And one of those businesses is Google. Google, 96% of revenue came from advertising. And while Google's ad network itself is clearly not running on a relational database, AdWords was running on MySQL until as recently as about a year ago. Now, they ran MySQL in an incredibly complex and difficult sharded configuration, but AdWords resembles the traditional business applications that 99% of you are building. It requires transactions. It requires um, consistency. Eventual consistency is not good enough for a bank, and it speaks SQL. So very quickly, and I'm running out of time here, so if you want to see the rest of this talk, you'll have to come to Santa Clara. But I'm going to talk about the evolution of storage at Google, so Google's big table and Google's mega store. Um, and then what I'm going to do is finish up with this idea of Google's spanner database. This is a database that they introduced in a paper. Um, I think spanner points the way towards the future of big data for most companies. And the important things about Spanner is that it's SQL-based, it provides transactions, it's horizontally scalable, and that's the big difference. The challenge of big data is now how do we scale horizontally while providing the same interface that most people are used to using, so that you can connect to your database using JDBC, using ODBC. And the big thing, the big the sort of big thing that you'll notice that all these systems share is they're focused on time, clock uncertainty, and consensus algorithms like Proxos. 
and that Google is really not the only one. There's companies like Translattice. There's a there's a, a bunch of uh, players that call themselves New SQL, like NeoDB and VoDB and Akiban. And then there's also a huge trend this year of so companies like Salesforce open sourcing um, things like Phoenix so that you can use SQL to query something that's an age base. And so this is the trend that you'll learn more about if you come to Santa Clara at the end of the month. And we'll pass it back to Alex. All right, good segue. Um, so uh, we love it when people uh, say you should come and find out more. Uh, we do have some questions for you if you have a couple of minutes. Um, so uh, there was a little bit of chatter on, on both here and on Twitter saying, you know, hey, wait, the you know, relational is not nearly as good as everyone says, and um, NoSQL will only be used in less mission-critical um, environments. Uh, companies need to stick with, with SQL and so on. I'm um, probably misparaphrasing some of these things, and they're quite long in the chat window, but um, what are your thoughts about um, whether SQL can actually be useful to a sector of the world um, or sorry, whether NoSQL can be useful to sector world where you're doing very deep sort of investigative jo joins and stuff like that. So I think that I think that SQL itself is divorced from the underlying storage mechanism. There's a there's a there's a good reason why you see people trying to create SQL interfaces to stuff like HBase. It's because I think it's really just what what people are used to doing. Um, as far as 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 far as like deeply investigative. Problems. There are problems that require map reduce to get done in any sort of reasonable amount of time. One of those is when you query Google. I mean, that's hitting like 800 servers at least. Right? These are things. There are problems that will never be centralized, and there are problems that always need some sort of big data approach, whether that involves a particular style of NoSQL database. The problem with NoSQL. I mean, it, just go go look at the NoSQL page on Wiki on uh, Wikipedia, and you'll see that it captures maybe seven very high-level categories of da da databases. What I'm talking about in terms of the future of big data being SQL, a lot of these players, a lot of these vendors, and even Google Spanner, at the base of what they're doing, they're storing these hierarchical schematized tables, which you could also look at and say that's kind of like a document store with structure. And what they've done is they've really just written an execution engine and a query optimizer that can understand SQL and translate that into queries against something that you could call a NoSQL storage mechanism. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, it did. Um, so I'm going to give you one more quick question since it's sort of uh, tangential to this. Traditionally, we've had two databases. We've had our offline analytical database that's doing uh, OLTP, and, and it's run by the BI team, and they're running analytics and crunching numbers. And then we've had our online database that is doing sort of production-level stuff, and it's in the line of business. It seems to me like when I use a modern application like Facebook, I am being when I do a Facebook um, uh, graph search, I am essentially being a BI person. I'm doing a complex join across five or six different tables based on those relations. And that means that we now have a billion data analysts. Does that mean that the convergence of the offline analytical database that's traditionally been the domain of data warehouses and the online production database, which has traditionally been the domain of uh, production SQL database, uh, does that mean those two are going to inevitably converge and we're going to have to throw out half of our data stores because the operational and the analytical data store will be the same thing? I don't think so. So I think there's a lot of vendors that will throw out a lot of claims that will tell you that, well, there doesn't have to be a difference between BI and your transactional database. Uh, but at a certain level, I think there really does, right, because you're solving two different problems. I think that you can bridge the gap somewhat. One of the things that if you look at the Spanner table, uh, if you look at the approach that Spanner uses, these schematized hierarchical tables, you can view them as a relational database, but then they're also, you can also view them as documents, right? That's something that Akeban put forward as well. If you look at that, what you're doing is it's unlike a traditional relational database where you just have tables and you can join them however, however you want. You're storing tables in a hierarchy that's predefined, that's optimized for a particular use case. This can, in certain, in certain circumstances, this can mean that you can run what would be considered a reporting query against an online sort of transaction database 
but there, I think that there's still a fundamental limitation um, if if you're trying to ask any question of some of these hierarchical table databases, you may suffer a performance penalty. So I, I just think, I think that at a fundamental level, you're, if you hear a vendor say, uh, you can run reporting off of this database and, you, and it can also fuel your online transaction processing, there are questions that need to be asked before that claim can be truly validated. All right, good answer. <clears throat> I think probably worth more discussion in Strata. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Um, and as you can tell, we've kind of lined up a bunch of different things across topics here, um, from the sublime to the ridiculous, um, ridiculous being things like the business singularity, sublime being like an equation for happiness. Um, up next is something, uh, different topic entirely, something pretty important. Um, we're going to be joined by Sandra Cuccinelli and Angelica Paratoralmos who are joining us um, to talk about what it means to do data journalism in a country where there are no laws like things like Freedom of Information Acts and the interesting and sometimes delicate interplay between the role of journalism in society and the openness of data within that society and how the two keep interacting with one another. Uh, Sandra and Anelga, are you guys there? Hi, uh, I'm Sandra, I'm Angelica, it's just right here. Me sitting um, in the preview of the SATA conference. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, and um, uh, we are going to stay in Santa Clara where we'll show how to create a model strategy for data journalism in a country with, uh, without open data. This is the, the same for us. Um, uh, if you can see us, uh, let me, one minute please. Yes, this is our project, how to promote data journalism in a country without open data. In the first slide, uh, you can talk what we are doing. Well, in a country where it, there is no open data, nor a law like Freedom of Information Act, there is a data team here in Buenos Aires City that is creating tools to help reporters and also citizens to analyze material and investigate important stories as the use of public money. I put the link here of one of an article, what was a lot of several articles about uh, the analysis of a long, long uh, data server from health insurance statements. And the second point is not only data journalists, also we are creating new applications. Uh, in this case, it was very, very difficult because uh, the question is how to do data journalists from papers using manual data entry for compare the evolution of the money and properties that have the precedent of uh, this country and her ministers, for example. It was a very, very hard work that we will show you in Santa Clara. But this is not all the story. Uh, there is something that uh, I believe that is the starting point. There is more important than doing data journalism. Here in Buenos Aires and also um, uh, baby steps by baby steps uh, in province, there is a data team that is created the boundary conditions that are present in another countries like uh, ours uh, and not in, in, in our country. Uh, for example, we have a case of study for an, an investigative report that used a database uh, of the World Bank because uh, um, it's no data in Argentina. We are looking for the data outside the country. Since deep searching web, uh, we are using monitoring of evidence found of loan from the World Bank uh, to the Argentine government. Um, in the slide, Number two, you can see our team. This is the product of uh, two years of work. And uh, I, I, I was here from last year, and we have created a data model of journalists 
based on team involving reporters and editors to take an interest in writing stories based on data. This, uh, this involves a task of um, evangelizing Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is the most difficult to do it, to try to talk about the people. Oh, what, what, what are you doing? Hey, data journalist, what is this? Is investigative journalist? Oh, no, well, yeah. Uh, is precision journalist? Oh, yeah. Is uh, computer assistant uh, journalist? Oh, yeah. It's all of that, but with data, math, and uh, add technology. So, sorry for my English, you know, it isn't <laughs> perfect, but I hope you understand. So, well, um, after this work, uh, we begin to work by project with single and personal training, and also at the same time uh, with an intensive training from a specially designed program uh, here indicated from La Nación newspaper. The particularity of this method is that there is a not a data team working alone. Uh, I will explain in Santa Clara why I prefer this model. There is, here there is a data team that works across all sections of the newsroom. It's uh, like a transverse, uh, transverse line crossing all the, se- the sections, including print edition and digital edition. So uh, about uh, the story, I, 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 I told you that this is, this is not all the story. We are creating the boundary conditions that are present in another country and, and not ours. I, I, I did say that. Uh, uh, but what more we did? Well, go into the province to talk about data journalists, talking with the students and teachers in university, talking with the NGOs, uh, inviting reporters to shine hackathon. Hey, say a reporter, what is a hackathon? Uh, it's a pirate? No, 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 you can shine with that. So, um, after also promoting these actions in social media and with all of this together, impro- improving transparency and accountability. You can see in the next uh, slide some photos of our uh, work in the last year. What about the province? What about outside the La Nación? Journalists, editors, professions, they want to know too. You can see the photos in Misiones province, top left, going to university, top right, also in hackathons to open data labs like um, our catalog. You can see bottom left. Well, I think that Things are changing in Argentina because of these actions. By creating new ways to access, to use open data, I believe that this could be a way to in- inspire another media in Latin America country where there are no open government policies, even without province of our country, to open data and expose them until the light of public opinion. Well, let me introduce my co-speaker, Angelica Peralta <laughs> Ramos. She's a nice person. She's the leader of the data project in La Nación. Angelica. Thank you, Sandra. I'm Angelica Peralta. I will uh, give a little context about La Nación. La Nación is based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, our Sunday print circulation is more than 360,000 copies. In lanacion.com that we have since 1995, uh, we have 11 million unique visitors per month. We also have nine magazine titles, including Hello Magazine, uh, Spanish version, and Spanish, not uh, Latin version, and uh, Rolling Stone. And Impermedia, since last year, uh, 90% of Impermedia is uh, U.S. Hispanic leading publishing company. So, uh, our vision for to, to do this data initiative in, in such a different, difficult context, uh, why? 
uh, and what is it? La Nación decided to challenge status quo and started opening data and developing data journalism. Uh, we, we found that we want to kill skepticism that there is no data in countries that are like lacking transparency. So we started doing it ourselves. As Sandra said, in a country with no FOIA, no data, gov portals, rank it 102 in Corruption Perceptions Index uh, of Transparency International, and without a strong presence in OGP initiative at that time. And the reason why is that data for us is the new raw material for journalism. Uh, we think that moving public data closer to the people will help everyone. We want to activate demand of public data, so more public data is demanded and needed by journalism and by the people. We want to discover new stories hidden in data sets, and that's what we are going to, I'm going to tell you in, in Santa Clara, as we have already done, from data sets that we ourselves uh, built from scratch or converted from PDF or whatever. Uh, to allow citizens' collaborations and also in, uh, open to innovation and to promote, of course, transparency and government accountability. And how? Well, uh, gathering and building data sets from scratch, detecting, transforming, building our own data sets, analyzing, opening the data, reporting, and interacting via social media, using every, every platform we have, we could design news apps with data gathered from various government websites, repositories, databases. Some were semi-opened, others closed, and mostly in PDF. Using free tools for opening and visualizing data. This is up to one scale, but this is uh, what we did. Uh, we used mostly daily reporting, Tableau Public, Google Docs, Google Spreadsheet, Google Maps, Google Fusion Tables, Junior Open Data Platform for our catalog. And also uh, promoting data presence in La Nacion.com, our website, with a homepage section in the main navigation bar, integrating a tag that integrates stories with op uh, that we publish with open data or data visualizations into our CMS for daily reporting, daily opening data that as we report in the open data catalog, blogging in Nation Data Blog, uh, of course. Uh, viralizing everything in uh, data in Twitter and now our new Facebook page, and organizing also uh, the first data fest in Latin America in Spanish to open and mine public data. Then we we realized that we have, we don't know only have to open but also to explain more than 20 data sets to work with data scientists in teams, and we did this with a with a university. So. Uh, and of course, producing data journalism, uh, besides what Sandra mentioned, we are going to explain our inflation data problem here in Argentina, or at least controver controversial uh, aspects of the official inflation versus the private consultant inflation rate, CPI. Also, we gather from provinces the five four or five provinces that publish independent CPIs, and we are publishing an opening for every reporter and citizen in Argentina to reuse. Also, the subsidies case for the subsidies for the bus transportation, more than uh, 1,000 uh, million pesos for that uh, one dollar, is the official is five pesos. Uh, so you can imagine per month uh, to more than 1,300 companies uh, from all the provinces and in Argentina, and also a case of uh, Senate expenses that just was published this, this weekend, last weekend. As a, all of these are front page stories that have become from, from the data to the front page, thanks to a teamwork with the, the journalism and the data team. Um, so some key factors and challenges, and what we love more are the challenges. <laughs> the key factors, uh, of course, teamwork, training, to use the free tools, to never stop learning, be proactive, 
collaboration, open to collaboration, work by project, to raise data awareness every day in the newsroom, to be proactive in hacktivism and, and open data events, to get help if, and to learn to, to ask for help, and in our case in, from international support like our night International Center for Journalism Fellowship, Sandra here, uh, our just uh, uh, launched Night Mozilla Open News uh, Partnership that we have a developer in our newsroom from Night Foundation, our, uh, and our da data set support. Our tech challenges is to, con now we have more than 3 million uh, documents from this very, very different uh, formats like images, uh, PDFs, mo most of them, PDFs, uh, text, uh, Excel, whatever, uh, DBF, um, many, many formats. And what we need is to extract the entities and connect the dots because there are lots of relationships between them. To we have to structure some of unstructured data that is published daily and to automate processes to bring data daily to readers and journalism in open formats. What we are doing, like almost manually or with a little help of technology, we want to scale this because I think we think this will scale journalism to and, and citizen accountability of government. And the human challenges engage more journalists and, da and data scientists and the developer community. Develop a platform that allows citizen collaboration to structure collaboration. It's very useful, for example, to screen 200,000 PDFs, 20,000 uh, uh, expenses or PDFs of, a, of another uh, subject. Examples like ProPublica free the files or, or, or the MPs expenses of the Guardian. Uh, we would like to, to develop something li like that. And to inspire, of course, and help other media and organizations to open data for Argentina. I, we, I think that NGOs uh, have lots of potential to, to learn to open data. They are asking for, for help, and, and of course, we ask them for help if we need uh, anything. But uh, we really think also companies should open data for everyone to learn and to analyze and to grow up and build new new things. So I think that is all. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. And uh, I apologize for the sound quality. Obviously, they're calling in from far, far away, and we do appreciate you guys making the effort to be here. But uh, they'll be uh, live and really easy to hear in person in Strata in a couple of weeks. Uh, so thank you both for the uh, look at what you're doing. It's a, it's a fascinating situation where you don't have uh, laws supporting you and, and you sort of can mine whatever is available opportunistically, and uh, we really appreciate that glimpse into it. Uh, our next speaker, Mark Madsen, uh, is going to be running a session within Strata focused on how enterprise IT is going to employ big data. Obviously, enterprise IT is a huge part of every company's nervous system. Um, and many of the shifts that we're seeing in big data, in ubiquitous computing, and so on, are transforming what it means to be enterprise IT. Once upon a time, the enterprise IT manager was in charge of protecting a scarce resource. Now they're charged with almost protecting the company from the things that can go wrong with an abundant resource. And that's a sea change in how people run company enterprise IT. Um, so Mark's running this track, which is the sort of comp companion to the big data uh, the big data for enterprise IT is the companion to the data-driven business day. There's two tracks. The business day is for uh, business types, and the enterprise IT day is for IT types. Um, and he wants to talk about waking up and smelling the data, although it looks like he needs to wake up and smell the date in this slide, which I guess is a call to urgency. Right, Mark? That was your call to urgency. Uh, these are my slides. That's right. Um, so uh, thanks for the introduction, and yes, just as a, as a reminder, we do have a track at Strata on that first day, sort of pre-conference, to talk about different things. And this particular track is focused on people who have to get started in an IT organization with big data. So there's a lot of talk about different topics, technology, architecture, but also staffing, how to hire people, how to manage data scientists. So. Uh, 
what I'm going to talk about is really, in this case, focused mainly on the kind of BI and analytics use cases. It's, it's the use cases of, of data processing and consumption. I'm going to leave the real-time action-oriented and transaction processing sides of, of big data to the other speakers. Um, so as we all know, there's been a ton of hype about big data. And the interesting thing to me is that it is – uh, definitely being hyped, but big data itself is not hype. But uh, what's going on in the media these days and, and analysts and uh, uh, people writing in, in IT and business magazines is that it's a lot like teenage sex, which is that there are lots of people talking about it, very few people doing it, and the ones who are doing it are doing it poorly. Uh, for the most part. And so we really need to kind of get down to what's real about big data. Now, one of the things is that we have been here before. Uh, we, there's always been big data. Uh, there was big data when Kepler was doing things. But if we take the sort of modern architecture, back in the 80s, the retail industry went from audit data. That's where you know they went in and they audited stores or they audited purchases and looked in people's grocery bags to see what was being sold. And, uh, and implemented point-of-sale scanners. And, you know, we got UPC codes. And once everything had a UPC code, then everything could be scanned. And um, now this is a slide from Bill Schmarzo at EMC, who will be one of the speakers in the track. Um, but, you know, back in this era, which is where I got my start with, with a lot of analytics and reporting and things, was that it didn't just throw more data in, which needed to be looked at. It changed completely business practices. And as the business practices changed, of course, the data needs themselves changed. And I think that's a key thing. The data enables practices and analysis, which enable you to change processes, which change what you measure. And there's a constant iterative cycle. There's an evolution here that always occurs. But there are big sea changes when technology reaches a point. In the 1980s, it was PCs, it was client server, it was the mini computer, it was the rise of the relational database. And that enabled a whole new set of things, which is why at the end of the 1980s, we end up with, you know, data warehouses and things. But in the big data world, we've been focusing on big. Just like back then, there were all these articles about size and the size of a database and 50 gigabytes was just an unheard of thing back then. Um, if we look at the the often quoted McKinsey paper, uh, the things that are highlighted are kind of interesting. You know, size beyond the ability of typical databases. But but of course, when they they say it, they qualify it because it's a moving definition because technology changes, uh, and their range is is from terabytes to petabytes, which is quite a large range. And, you know, this is a pretty suspicious sort of bunch of weasel wording that these guys have come up with, you know, these sort of house of cards model of big data, I guess. Um, and what they're focusing on is the least interesting aspect because they, just like most of the, the stuff being written out, they're focused on big. And the problem is that we've had big for a long time. This slide uh, from Teradata is from 1986 when they shipped the first terabyte-sized database uh, server. So that truck, of course, housed the server. You can guess that uh, just how horrendous it was building terabyte-scale systems at that point. But that was 1986. I mean, we're, we're talking more than, than you know 25 years. And if you look at the, the technology capability and data volumes, this chart was thrown together by somebody uh, who will be my co-speaker at uh, the next strata, Mark Demarest. Um, you know, the the traditional, call it universal database market, is that orange line, which is holding steady in the, you know, 100 to 200 terabyte range. And, you know, there are people running databases even bigger in, in things like Oracle and DB2. But for the most part, the green line is what, what you're really interested in, which is into the multiple petabytes range. Um, and that is MPP relational SQL-based databases. And those guys, for analytic use cases, are hanging in to the multiple petabytes. And it's really only when you get uh, up above many petabytes that you start to get into the we can't do this in the traditional ACID-compliant relational database. So you know that is the ACID-compliant query database curve followed by the big data curve. So 
uh, as the previous speaker said, you know, there's a lot of room to uh, to grow with SQL. But you know, let's look at the architecture. The architecture, the conceptual architecture, you know, what boxes we must engineer and build is really captured in this 1988 paper by Devlin and Murphy, uh, much of which is, is sort of recapitulated in a design methodology and data architecture sense four years later in Bill Inman's book on building the data warehouse. And so that sort of set the tone for the next 25 years. But, you know, the architectures of today need to be built differently because the technologies of today are 25 years of changes away in terms of databases and other things. And I'd say that our conceptions about how information is, is produced, how it's used, and what it's used for are, are outdated in the BI and analytics part of the market. Uh, we've tended to focus on some things that I, I think – are architectural anomalies these days. One of them, you know, the metadata catalog. We call it a metadata catalog. We keep it like a like a an actual card catalog separate from the data. You typically can't query your metadata. And yet the metadata tells you where everything is, what's in there and potentially a whole lot more. But it's captured separately from a database, it's captured in different tools, it's not that accessible. Half the time it's valuable simply to browse that for users, but it's not simple or easy. You know, we still talk about reports and dashboards as if these things are fixed on paper. And then we store them in folder hierarchies and and other things that make them hard to find and inaccessible. And you go into any sizable organization, you're going to find thousands to tens of thousands of reports. But of course, it's a largely manual task to navigate to the right place to find them. And so We've been using these physical paradigms to treat things that should be treated differently. And the last thing is really that all of the business intelligence market, you know, dashboards, OLAP, all of this stuff, thinks about publishing. Right? We publish good data out to the organization to be used, and people consume it. But the reality is that people aren't just consumers of data. They take that information, then they mix it with something else, and then they – they move on. They might even modify it. And the only way you can do that in today's data warehousing world is you export your reports into Excel, and then you move on from there. Or you use Microsoft Access or something which gives you some data manipulating that you don't typically have because we treat a database, a data warehouse, as read-only. Now, that's not to say that there's no value. You know, I loved doing data warehouse projects because for a long time, it was very gratifying. You're giving people access to information that they didn't have access to before. All of a sudden, you know, the, the, their their eyes get wide, they see all of this potential, and then they get to work. And after they've gotten to work for a while, you know, the, the easy stuff's done, the hard stuff starts to come in, and, of course, the environment slows down because, as an earlier speaker mentioned, monolithic architecture and enterprise architecture rules the day in this market. Enterprise architecture does not keep up with change. And information uses change rapidly. And you know, the, the talk in the BI world has been self-service and giving users autonomy and things like that, but you can't just do that at the user interface layer, which is where all of that talk is focused. It actually goes deeper into the data stores and the data processing because autonomy is a trade-off. When you give people more autonomy, you introduce some complexity. So what we've done in the data warehouse is we've made these, these trade-offs by simplifying things for casual users of data. Right? They can consume information, but, you know, God help you if they actually touch or change any of it. And if they need to analyze it in ways that combine sort of data blending and mixing things up or doing other stuff, different tool set. They can get the data out, and then they've got to go somewhere else to their own sandbox to deal with it. So it tends to be, you know, in the data warehousing and business intelligence world, erring on the side of model everything once and get it right the first time and shunt the data in. But of course, that creates bottlenecks, because now everything has to flow into one place where it all has to be processed into a perfect data model before it can be made available, which then causes scalability and performance problems. And interestingly, this is always couched as a positive, but it's not always a positive, and that it enforces a single model, this 
so-called single version of the truth. Well, there is no single version of the truth. I mean, version of the truth should tell you that. But the problem is that it's contextual, and your uses of data and whether it's good enough or not good enough or in the right form or not in the right form are dependent on the questions you are asking. And so you need to have some level of model or metadata flexibility, which is absolutely not part of that. And this is one of the reasons you see a rise in data discovery and exploration tools as a counter to the conventional BI model. Because the BI tools, they're designed for reporting and dashboards. They're standardized. Instead of standardizing based on tool capabilities to do different sets of tasks, we standardize on a vendor and we, we standardize the roles people are in. We're making people conform to the software instead of making software conform to the people. So, you know, we, we have those problems. And then the other thing is that the E in Enterprise Data Warehouse was a lie because, in fact, most of the data is not there. So, you know, a lot of the enterprise data that you want has been modeled out because it was deemed by somebody who gathered requirements that it wasn't important because nobody said it was. Now, if you look at the history of measurement, it started with all the convenient stuff. Transactional data was easy. We could get it. It's machine generated. It's valuable, so it goes in. But all of this stuff about what people say and what they do, surveys and, and customer reports, and you know, if you're using something like Net Promoter Score, all of this marketing stuff tended not to go in, as well as a lot of your operational data, your uh, manufacturing logs and log files and events that sort of inconvenient data which tends to be big. And what we really need is to expand the environment, the design methods and models to encompass all of this stuff. And the way to do that is not the way McKinsey says, which is gather all of your data, and in this giant green field of data, there's bound to be a pony in there somewhere, as Mark Demarest would say. The, the reality of data strategy is that you have to actually start with, with goals because it's, it's about using big data. And the thing is that most current views focus on big, and they focus on data. And as I've already mentioned, big is, well, number one, not as big as most people think. And you can have small data and have big data problems, which is why big data is such a paradoxical name. Also, it's not just about the data. We've got lots of data. It's about how we use it and how we process it and the concepts and context that we're using. Because if you're not producing data for use and applying it, then you're just producing expensive trivia. And so one of our speakers is going to talk in this track about how to make big data worthwhile. You know, you, don't, you start with a goal, and then you find a solution for it. But most big data projects today are, we, we want to get this Hadoop thing in the IT department. What can we use to solve it with? You know, the, the hammer running around finding things to hammer problem. So value is important, goals and values go together, but simple dollar value isn't enough because the information has to be actionable. Otherwise, you've got expensive trivia. If you can't act on the information that you produce, then you've got a problem. And this is why we have all these return on X kind of metrics, because you're investing dollars and you're going to produce something. Um, and some things require a lot of process change or people changes or changes in how you conduct business or how you incent people. And that always slows down the adoption of information-based practices because you have to change something in order for it to be usable. And so the more change there is, the longer it takes, the more costly it becomes. And so you can't just use value. You have to use value and actionability. And that means understanding how people use information. You know, people make decisions and have different contexts context of monitoring. You know, watch what's going on and look for exceptions. When there's an exception, look at the exception. You know, why did an out of stock occur in retail or why did my gas station catch on fire? And then um, you do, you know, analysis of causes which can be anything from very simple to very complex operations research. Decisions tends to fall more into the, you know, either you decide or you don't because it's obvious or you actually apply operations research or do trade-off analysis or a hundred other collaborative things, and then you act, which is making a decision is just making a decision. Somehow the organization has to, has to take action. And then when this happens, there are two other contexts. One is that you act inside a process, which 
is what you've already got. Second is that you act on the process, which changes the process, which means you collect new data, which means you have to figure out what to monitor, what's going to be analyzed, and this is the feedback loops that data warehousing and their methodologies forgot about. Things change, but the monolith doesn't. So, you know, that's where you have your sort of conventional BI with its dashboards, reporting, and other things. They tend to fit well on the bottom, but they don't tend to fit well on the top, acting on a changing process, which is where some of the causal analysis, statistics, uh, data science-y sort of stuff comes. And if you put that into a business context, it's the assumptions that you have about what you're doing. Order, unorder, or disorder. The orderly world of dashboards and fixed reports, the unordered world of data exploration and ad hoc query and, and basic stats to the, the we don't know what's going on, we have to test things, sense, and then respond. The world of A-B testing data science and causal analysis. And our environments don't support this well. BI does the first box, eh, okay on the second box. Big data depends on the second box. They're both sort of intersect weekly at that point, and then big data kind of definitely falls into the third box. But it's not a rip and replace, right? There is no such thing as a free lunch. When you take one set of capabilities, you trade off another. So what you have then is a split world at this point in the market where what we've been doing addresses is this side of the overall business processes and uses of data. Big data tends to fit on this side, on the right side of things. It's not ad hoc reporting and all that. And the reason is that there are trade-offs, response times, real-time response to queries, the tooling. Big data's got a huge last mile problem. You know, you have to custom build interfaces and you typically get crappy performance without a custom build application on the front. And so you've got delivery infrastructure on one side and processing infrastructure on the other, and we need to marry this stuff. And the other thing is that analytics, in the sense of algorithms and algorithmic processing, make the data volume problem bigger. 500 gigabytes might not be that terribly much, and yet you throw an order in squared or in cubed problem in the case of these iterative algorithms, and suddenly all hell breaks loose in your database, which is why technically databases aren't always the best platform which means the data warehouse needs to store or make data available across two different stores, one for processing and one for query and retrieval, which means we're now building an environment that is bigger than just that data warehouse in the middle. We're building the, the building over the building. And so that's it in a nutshell. That's the kind of stuff we're going to talk about on that, that day. And so um, you know, really just talking about the architectural reconfigurations, data architecture, access, data management, organization, skills, all of these things have to change because we're shifting from an old model to a new model, just like we did in the world of uh, a business intelligence the first time around, and just like we saw in Web 2.0. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Alistair. Awesome, Mark. And uh, as always, your uh, choice of images uh, is amazing to me. Uh, it's like you spend all your time on Reddit, Flickr, Creative Commons. Yeah, that's um, 90%. That ninety percent, nicely done. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm in the adjacent room, so I'm gonna have to watch it online afterwards. But uh, I know your sessions are always fascinating. All right, um, we'll hand things over without further ado to John Feeland, who's gonna talk about the provocative topic of zombie diaries and walking vampires. John, thanks, Alistair. So my name's uh, John Feeland. I'm the CEO and founder of Argus Insights, and we're here to talk to you about a public health threat. We're very concerned about what's happening in human society today. Uh, somewhere in the uh, October-November time frame, when most of the world was focused on what is happening with the U.S. election, we became concerned about another type of red versus blue threat and really started to track and understand um, what was happening within the growing conversations and growing infestation and infection of zombies and vampires throughout society. And we took it upon ourselves to really start digging into the information to understand, can we see what the vectors of infection are? Can we monitor it in a way that makes sense to people and make it readily available? And then understand which populations are most at risk. Um, part of what you're going to see today is us going through the process of identifying those initial vectors and introducing what we uh, lovingly call the Zompire Index. So, but first, a little bit of history. We are at risk. The early literature around both of these populations have been really around trying to establish a fear factor 
uh, to prepare human society for the threats that both these different types of undead set for us, starting from Bram Stoker's Dracula back in the 1800s to really establish uh, the legacy of Vlad the Impaler as something to be feared and to be, uh, not to be misunderstood as, as something fun to play with. Hollywood takes over with Bela Lugosi, although now we look at it with, with comic nature. At the time, it was terrifying. It was a horror movie designed to build within us. We survive saber-toothed tigers. There's a new threat now with vampires, different types of things involved. But then there's a shift that's taking place as these populations start to infiltrate us even more as a society. When you put Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise in movies as vampires, you change it from being threatening to sexy for part of the population. And that trend continues with the release of the Twilight series where now we've gone from being kind of uh, the dangerous seduction of the vampire, uh, uh, in interview with a vampire, to now we have something where vampires are lovers to be embraced to the point where their greatest weakness now becomes a strength and they sparkle in sunlight. We've taken our fears and turned them to our friends and lovers, which is a real challenge uh, and part of the overall plan, I think, to take over the world um, by this particular type of undead. We had the same issue a bit with zombies. Romero's presentation in The Night of the Living Dead was literally a documentary in fear. Uh, if you see somebody shambling, seem to be in pain, groaning, do not help them. They're there to eat your brains. And we see a similar shift as it goes in the most recent Shaun of the Dead, where now vamp uh, zombies are, are they're our friends. They're things to be harnessed, to be used. And we see another shift where now high literature takes into play, where Jane Austen's beloved tale of pride and prejudice now is overlaid with the backdrop of a zombie infection infestation within that time frame. We see a complete shift now where you see the unthinkables now happen with the release of warm bodies. Now zombies are being known as lovers and friends as well. And so as a society, we're, we're at threat, we're at risk. Two dangerous groups of undead have both transitioned from points of terror and fear to now things to be loved and cared for and cradled. With any epidemic, uh, kind of, uh, epidemic study, you always have to find patient zero, be it typhoid, Mary, any of those sorts. And we actually went to, to Twitter to see what we could find within the social data. And here's maybe one candidate for it. This is a, in a suburb of Macon, Georgia, in which individual is, is lamenting uh, why Vampire Diaries is so good. Obviously someone who's been infected uh, by a love of our new vampire overlords. And you can see, given the location, they're very close to wooded area, which would be a wonderful cover for the vampire coven. And we realize that within Twitter, there are the what means to actually understand what might be driving infection, what might be driving adoption, and to really understand where the threat lies uh, for us as a nation. So starting back in October, with the help of our partner, Gannep, we started polling Twitter to understand what might be true infections and bites within the overall space. We didn't widen the search to include every Twilight fan page or, or every uh, homage to Walking Dead in particular, but really trying to focus on those true pieces. What we things we found was that the gender balance between the two was surprising. Uh, zombies were equally balanced between men and women talking about uh, their, their infection and, and what was really driving that, whereas vampires were definitely uh, biased more towards women uh, as well. And people actually are talking more about zombies than vampires uh, within the social streams. We sort of make sense. Uh, vampire populations are self-limiting given the number of people that they have to have around to consume the way we do cows and corn. Um, the other thing to notice within the data is you start to see in more recent times peaks are around a certain time of the week as people uh, pony up to the, to the temple that is Vampire Diaries for that particular branch and vector of infestation, whereas we see a similar pop for, um, for warm bodies uh, most recently in February as people flock to that uh, particular notion. Well, get within the data, we started trying to understand how do we monitor this? How do we measure this? How do we actually develop what we now call the Zompire Index? We needed a way to track these epidemics and as they move through the nation, through the population, normalize for the state population to understand what the relative strength is of the infestation, and how to balance the power. We know that zombies kind of have a head start, and there's people talked about more. Vampires are trying to come back with the, uh, the different vectors that we'll talk about later. And so we realized that people were used to seeing 
a platform of, uh, of a different type of, of monitoring of process, that of the electoral map. And so this is actually the electoral map from the New York Times that covers the final results of the 2012 election. And uh, it's well known now that red states were, were really the ones reading for uh, Mitt Romney and the blue states were really the ones uh, voting for Barack Obama. We adopted that same point of view of, of red versus blue, but with a slightly different twist, uh, realizing that vampires themselves, because they go after the, the oxygenated blood of the living, we kind of model it as red states, uh, and, and zombies, considering that they're undead and don't really br have to breathe anymore, uh, the blue veins of, of, of the blue states. And in doing so, when we did, went through that normalization, we end up with the following kind of map of the United States. What you see here uh, is really the balance of power and which states are actually the most at risk for the different infections. Uh, one thing to note is that um, the vampires have made a concerted effort in Louisiana, commonly uh, saw uh, as the uh, birthplace of, of zombies given the, the ties to voodoo and with New Orleans, et cetera, uh, and so really make a concerted effort to kind of hold that bastion within Louisiana. Uh, and also the great northeast is, is, uh, seems to be really excited about the vampires, whereas the, the Rust Belt and the um, kind of the Midwest is really – and the South, the, the Southwest is also areas where the zombies are doing quite well. Not surprisingly, the swing states of, of Wisconsin and Florida are still trying to make sense of it, whereas California is still up for grabs, which makes sense considering that Hollywood is actually the source of many of the infection vectors that the state of California would be still confused as to whether to uh, fall prey to the zombie um, infections or to bow to our vampire overlords. One of the interesting things to note is that, uh, with a few exceptions, the blue states of zombies tend to overlay quite a bit with the red states of the conservatives, and the red states of vampires tend to actually relate quite significantly to the blue states of the liberals. Now, depending on your political perspective, you could view this as, well, of course, the blue states like vampires, they're sucking the blood from our economy. Or if you're more on the uh, liberal side, you could see the zombie infestations within the conservative states as, well, of course, they're mindless hordes anyway. It makes total sense. And so... We've taken this and said, okay, this gives us now a chance to understand which populations are, are driving the, um, the infections and the control within which parts of the, of, the, of the nation. And what's the next step? The next step is to take this and understand what the vectors of infection are, which, uh, which means are being used to engage uh, uh, the, po the populace, the human society, to either come on the side of zombies or vampires. Then our next step that you'll actually see in a couple weeks in Santa Clara is to determine the, the markers for those at risk within those, those uh, groups of, of zombies and vampires, um, lovers and affiliates. Uh, are they more likely to drink Franzia? Are they more likely to use Axe body spray? How do we start to build clusters of affinities to understand which populations, which segments are most at risk for infection by these two dual threats to, uh, to our society? So next we're going to look a little bit at the, what the vectors of infections are for zombies. We've basically gone through it with our normalization to understand the topics that are driving conversation uh, and show you which states are actually per capita um, pretty much already under this way. Uh, across the top you see that zombie apocalypse as a meme itself ends up being what drives the most conversation within the social sphere as people either talk about either fearing or already succumbing to the notions of the zombie apocalypse. Uh, of course, Walking Dead uh, is, is, is near after that. Then the uh, battle against Nazi zombies within the Black Ops video game um, uh, franchise follows soon after that. And since lots of discussions of last night, and we see actually this meme show up across both zombies and vampires in which people basically start to views if they've been infected or, uh, or bitten at the night before. Oh, man, I had a real binger last night. Now I feel like a zombie. Or, oh, my goodness, I stayed up all night. So that's something that's also shown up quite a bit, as well, of course, most recently warm bodies. The issue piece to see is the distribution of these things as a mix of either both East Coast engagement, as we see Rhode Island is definitely the, the bastion of, of warm bodies fans, but also areas that are maybe less populated. Um, in terms of people in, in, in West Virginia uh, really taking on the, the Nazi zombies and folks in Arkansas really resonating with the walking dead. Um, and so trying to understand and unpack which states are most at risk is, is really helping us understand what we need to do and where we need to focus our education efforts to help fight these infections and return society back to the hands of the living. When we look at the vampire infections, we, we see that actually there's not only higher per capita infection rates in, in many locations, but that the television memes of vampire diaries really is driving a lot of conversation. Uh, North Dakota, we should just, in West Virginia, when it comes to vampire diaries, they are lost to us now. 
When you move to the notion of Vampire Slayer, you see two types of conversations come into play. Part of it's homage back to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and part of it is actually uh, students lamenting they didn't learn that Abraham Lincoln really was a vampire slayer in their high school history uh, classes which of course leads to the meme of people engaging with uh, Vampire Hunter itself. We do find that there tend to be more men uh, and boys engaged with uh, Lincoln as, a, as a, the hero of, of taking on the undead, whereas more women are engaged um, in conversations around what happened this week on Vampire Diaries. The, the last two were, were, were kind of surprising a little bit. We have a band who has little to do with vampires other than their name. We think it's part of a campaign to actually uh, get people um, uh, kind of lulled into engagement, right? Uh, Brittany had her types of, of engagements that she's had with people over the years. And I think Vampire Weekend's about uh, preparing uh, our lives for, for greater uh, infestation that way. And then as we discuss the last night piece showing up both in zombies and vampires, as people reflect on their prior night's activities and how it may have made them more at risk for infection. In the end, it doesn't look good. Both, both groups of undead are gaining a strong foothold within our society. Uh, we now know which states are, are either lost uh, or close to being lost, and we're, we're learning more about uh, what those vectors of infection are. Our next step is really to understand which populations are at risk, and, and as you'll see uh, during the session on, at Daring Strata next week, in, uh, in two weeks in Santa Clara, we will talk more about those populations and how our analytics within social media uh, have helped us under, understand, uh, identify, and then hopefully warn them. So if you want to learn more about how to protect your friends and family, please attend our session next week, and we look forward to seeing you and talking with you then. Thank you. That was great, John. So can you guarantee that you were actually uh, using looks, uh, lookups for zombie and vampire and not just proxies for some other demographic? Yes. Okay. Yes. You didn't just take liberal and conservative? No. Because <laughs> it would have been a no. great presentation, but I'd go read it differently. Yeah, it's actually quite uh, – it was quite a surprising. It wasn't um, – we thought we'd use red and blue to kind of drive the analysis just for, for fun. Uh, but when we actually found that the uh, maps overlaid that much, that was uh, an insanely surprising outcome. It's fascinating because I think you'll find Fox News telling you that they've got an entirely different demographic of bloodsuckers. So um, <laughs> really appreciate you bringing a little little uh, levity to this. And, and it's a great example of uh, the data taking you where you don't necessarily expect it to uh, in that case. So uh, thank you very much for sharing it for it with us. Um, our next speaker, Vadim, is uh, from Metamarkets. And uh, he's going to take us on a slightly more serious um, vein, but we did try to make sure today's uh, session was properly um, spread across the, the myriad topics we'll be covering in Strata. Uh, Vadim works with Metamarkets, and he's going to be talking about visualization um, and recursion there. So uh, Vadim, take it away. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Vadim, and I, as, uh, as Alison mentioned, I work for Metamarkets. Uh, at Metamarkets, I pretty much spend my uh, entire working day making visualizations for the web, and uh, my background comes from playing around with toolkits like uh, Protoviz and D3 and really exploring uh, how to make visualizations and make them really accessible to people. Uh, at Metamarkets, I work on, I think, big data. I say I think because there's like lots of different definitions of big data. I haven't fully nailed down what it means, but uh, it, at least uh, I'm fairly confident that, that this is really big data. And in working and trying to write visualizations on top of a, of a big data platform, um, I always face this one struggle. And the sense is uh, whenever I make a visualization, it's always very nice. Um, it works on my small little sample file. Uh, and, and this is how you usually play around with, with, with the actually designing visualizations. But then there's the really annoying task of actually getting the data out of the database. Because um, obviously, if you're, if you're working on top of a large data store, you're never like literally visualizing all of the data points that you have. You're just, you're just visualizing some aggregation. That, like that's par for the course. It's, uh, if, if you can visualize all of your data points, then uh, you don't have this problem and you can kind of ignore uh, what I'm saying. Uh, and it's really interesting to see how to actually extract that out of a database because uh, sometimes it feels like a non-trivial task. And in fact, when I started doing this, when I started kind of getting into visualizations, which I have to power with the uh, backend and figure out how to translate what I want, um, 
into the backend language, uh, may, may it be SQL in your world, maybe uh, in, at MetaMarkets we use a platform called Jord. Uh, it, it, was, it was kind of annoying. I felt like I was doing a lot of work twice, defining the visualization, defining the database query. Uh, and it, at some point it struck me that, um, holy moly, these things are actually uh, connected. And I am doing, essentially, I'm not following the do not repeat yourself paradigm. I'm, I'm essentially doing twice the work that I need to be doing. And, and this, this realization occurred to me when I saw um, – when I read a series of, uh, of papers written by Hadley Wickham, who I, he definitely didn't invent this, but he really defined this in a, a really easy to understand way that uh, kind of triggered something in me that made me suddenly realize, wow, everything, everything here is really connected. I understand, I finally understand uh, the group by in SQL and I understand all of these all of these basics, and I definitely recommend you to read it. And I'll try to give an overview here, and I'll uh, try to give an overview at my uh, uh, larger Strata presentation, and I'll see how this connects uh, to data visualization as well. So the idea is that there is this basic uh, notion called split, apply, combine, three really simple operations that can really describe most data queries that you want to want to actually take out of the database. And when you, actually, when you actually address the database, you have to speak in the database's language, like SQL or, or NoSQL or, or whatever your database uses. Uh, but uh, it, split, apply, combine is the underlying thing that you're really saying to the database. And you can um, think about it in this way. Uh, you have some data. It's just data points. By the way, uh, I really loved Tom O'Brien's definition and uh, how he used the term no join. This is kind of the, the missing thing from the slide. When I think of data, and I think of kind of a large amount of data, I think of data you don't have to like perform a join on. So the database technology doesn't matter. It can be a huge table in MySQL, it can be a, a Druid instance, it can be uh, something in Greenplum, but um, and maybe actually in SQL it can be like a big table with a simple like lookup joins, but I, I, I don't really care about that. I just imagine a, a big table of data where each row marks your data point and there's like a bunch of attributes, uh, which are the columns. So you start off with, with your huge collection of data and then you, you split it up into buckets. And um, in SQL this is called a group by, but uh, we'll touch on that in a second. So imagine you, go to each data point and you like label it. In this case, uh, it's color coded. Uh, you label it with like, let's say you split it up by country. So you say the first data point, you are like in Canada, you go to the Canadian pile and you go through all of your data like that. You, you have a function that maps your data points to uh, what bucket it goes into. Uh, and then you have them, uh, you have your data split into several buckets and that's great. The next step that you can do is you can apply something. Well, uh, this is commonly referred to as metrics in BI world, uh, where you take this whole bucket and you run some sort of a function that like goes through all of the data in that bucket or you know, most of the data in the bucket and gives you some number as a result. Uh, so like the type of it is a list of data to a number. And uh, this could be like calculate the, the total revenue from all of these uh, re like revenue, like maybe I have events which are sales and they have, they happen in different countries. These are my, re this is my revenue for this particular country. And then once you have that revenue, um, it, like for assigned to that bucket, you can just combine them in some way. And, and this is kind of the simplest and most intuitive step. Uh, you're very likely going to have too many buckets to really want to just kind of show all of them. Maybe with countries, you can, you can actually show all the countries in one table. That would be fine. But uh, you can imagine having a million of buckets if you, for example, had Wikipedia edits and you were splitting apart by which article they belong to. Well, there's millions of articles on Wikipedia. You can't really show all of that. So uh, you combine it and you get a table or some data output uh, from that. And my, my point is that uh, not that this is some sort of innovative way to, to access your data. 
In fact, we've been doing this all along. Uh, if you're manipulating data with pivot tables in Excel, if you're, you're running SQL queries, uh, if you're, I mean, MapReduce is essentially split, apply, combine, except uh, they, you call it differently, and the, the focus is on actually distributing across different machines. Uh, here, this is just a theoretical idea behind it. Uh, even though this, this seems very simple, it's actually a very powerful concept. I, I find that it really cleared up a lot of the things when, when I started thinking in these terms. Uh, the, the way this relates to, to common data languages, for, uh, in this case, I'm going to give the SQL example because I feel this is the most uh, commonly known data language that people can relate to. But uh, my personal uh, experience deals more with uh, working on top of Druid, which is uh, a database developed within MetaMarkets. And my coworker, Eric Shredder, would be giving a, a presentation at also at Strata, so you should check it out. Uh, people who liked my talk would also like Eric's talk. Um, and, uh, but in SQL, you can see I, I kind of try to express the statement that I drew on the previous slide using SQL here. So if you have some big table called my data table, uh, and, it, and it has um, a revenue and a country as a column, and it doesn't really matter what, what it is otherwise, uh, you can select those two sum, and the important thing is that you group by. Uh, the, the thing that's kind of confusing about SQL, in my opinion, is that SQL like naturally does it in the wrong order. You sort of, you first you say your apply, then you say your combine later, and then, uh, then you, uh, sorry, then you say your split, which, uh, but it's fine. You can translate it to that. And this is, this is how it looks. And you could essentially issue the same query in any of those other uh, languages, and it will perform the same. Uh, now, my idea is that uh, this is how we query databases. But I started looking at visualizations that I was writing, and it struck me that, I, like, I'm using those same ideas in defining visualizations when I'm, say, working with D3, except that uh, I essentially use a superset of, superset of these ideas. Um, I kind of extend the language here. So if you look at this really simple visualization, it's for the same data that I uh, split in the previous slide, and you can see that uh, I split uh, by, by country here to get the different countries from my data. And then I actually lay out on the, on the y-axis, I lay out these countries. So I have this split, I also have this kind of layout operator that's an extra bit on top of it that is meaningless to the database. The database doesn't care how I'm gonna lay out my data, but I mean, the visualization does. And there's color in the visualization, like uh, when I apply, I say, well, map it to the, to the bar and color it gray. Uh, and again, the database, uh, could not care less about what color I'm going to paint this in, but um, it, it is important. So this is essentially uh, a superset of the split apply combined language. You have certain operations that only are meaningful within visualization, like, hey, let's label this, um, and uh, let's plot these bars like this. Uh, and I think this can be used to describe quite a few uh, visualizations. So this is obviously an extremely simple visualization that I'm showing here. This is just for a matter of demonstration. But um, I, the, the beauty here is that you can apply this sort of idea recursively. Uh, if you split, if you take your data, and you consider your initial data is just being in one huge bucket called like my data, yay, awesome. Um, you split that into several buckets, each of those buckets is the same sort of thing as your initial data bucket. So you could keep splitting them. And in fact, uh, a lot of the more interesting analysis that you can do on data relies on you doing a split more than once. And um, you might group by in SQL several times uh, and uh, similar things you can do in other databases. And in visualization, you also sometimes need to split or facet uh, in it more than once. For example, in this visualization, you can see there's two splits. The first one splits according to state and combines to only get the six states that probably have the top, uh, the top population count. And then within each state, we split by a bucketing 
of uh, age. Uh, and obviously, when you split on a continuous dimension, you have to bucket it. Uh, again, uh, I encourage you to go read and, uh, into the Hadley Wickham paper. It's uh, a real gem. Um, and I, I think that uh, this visualization, the previous visualization, and many, many more visualizations can be described in such a simple way uh, by just extending the split apply combine uh, paradigm. Now, uh, I'm super excited about that because for me that would save a lot of time. Uh, if you imagine, uh, if you imagine me having to spend half my day writing the visualization and the other half uh, just figuring out what database queries uh, I need to run, well, just realizing that both of both of them. Uh, work on split apply combined saves me a lot of time because it gives me a mental framework to sort of just, it's like a formula to just do a computation. Now obviously it's silly to just have me apply a formula on paper uh, every time I want to make a new visualization. So what I try to do is um, formalize it in a sense, make a toolkit on top of it. The idea is that uh, unlike another toolkit where you just kind of have the data and you then map it to your visualization principles. The idea is you start by describing the visualization, but you use the superset of the split apply combine language. Then the split apply combine operations are a subset of your visualization description. In this case, if I used my description of this visualization, uh, the bar chart, I could then easily, well, with a translator, I could go back and I have all the information necessary. I throw out the color, I throw out the layout. I, I don't care how I'm going to label it, the top or bottom. I just throw out all of this information that's only particular to the visualization. I am left with split by uh, by country, apply sum of revenue, order by decreasing revenue, limit to five. And this is something that I can then translate into a query that my database understands, and this process can be automatic. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, and this is, um, sorry, this is the idea of my talk, and uh, at, at my Strata talk I will be giving some demos of this and be, uh, discussing uh, more complex visualizations and how like layouts essentially allow you to do pretty much uh, anything that's a sensible visualization to build on top of this. And hopefully the idea is that uh, it will make designing visualizations on top of big data a lot a lot easier. I don't know how many people out there are you know, trying to make visualizations on top of big data, so I would really love to connect with anybody who does, uh, and maybe you can come and even talk to me after uh, on my office hours. Uh, this is... This is what I'm going to be presenting on. I'm going to hand it back to Alistair. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, uh, I'd love to talk now or at office hours. Sure. So if you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat utility. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. This is a good example of that. And I think we definitely crossed a long list of topics today from uh, zombies to business to IT to data to journalism to visualization and beyond. So. Um, I guess our real hope here is that uh, you've got a taste of exactly how much stuff is going on in Strata and uh, some of the things that will be worth checking out while you're there. Um, if you have questions, you can always reach out to us on uh, Twitter, on the StrataConf hashtag, uh, or in the chat room here. Uh, and as Zamina said at the beginning, all of the stuff will be available online shortly uh, for you to review. But we hope you'll see it in person with us on the West Coast. Uh, so thank you all very much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Great. Thank you so much, Alistair. And on behalf of O'Reilly Media, we thank Alistair for organizing today's online conference. We say a very big thank you to all of our speakers and presenters today. Their talks were fascinating. Thank you to our attendees who joined us today. And we'd like to leave you all with um, EMC, our sponsor today, Green Plum. Um, big thank you to them and to let you know that EMC Green Plum is driving the future of data warehousing and analytics with breakthrough products, including the Green Plum Data Computing Appliance, Green Plum Database, Green Plum HD Enterprise Ready Apache Hadoop, and Green Plum Chorus, the industry's first enterprise data cloud platform. EMC Corporation is the world's leading developer and provider of information infrastructure, technology, and solutions. Thank you, Greenplum. Folks, this will conclude today's online conference. Goodbye, everybody.